there's two things happening when we're talking about isotype switching. The first thing that we're having is in that of a normal B cell, a resting B cell, if you think about it that way, or a naive B cell. And the other type of isotype switching is this type of isotype switching that only occurs when we have an active infection. For the normal uh, conditions, you are, should be pretty much familiar with this, but under normal conditions, the only type of isotypes that are being produced uh, in the naive B cell would be the IgD and then the IgM antibodies. And this is brought about by the alternative RNA splicing between the mu and delta segments. This should be relatively familiar with you. I mean, if, if you take in general biology, and we talked about that pretty much in detail. Um, and when we went over the actual infection response, I don't think that we had uh, really in depth. I felt like it was a little rushed, and so this is kind of what I wanted to stress about this. So with the infection, what we have here is or really just for the isotype gene segments here, we have in front of everything, there is going to be a switch region followed by a specific gene. Okay, um, and now the switch region, some things you may want to know about is the fact that it's a CG rich sequence and it's made up of a lot of uh, pentameric or heptameric or a bunch of repeats depending on the identity of the gene that's in front. In case this wasn't given to you or in case this wasn't apparent to you, this would be a constant domain gene. Um, one of them being like of the of the many different isotypes that we can have, uh, mu for for uh, m or gamma for g, and then all the other ones that are specific that we showed on that picture slide here. So in the presence of infection, what we have here is I'm going to switch to a brighter color. After an infection, we have say an effector T cell or a natural killer cell coming in, and it's going to go ahead and produce these things called cytokines, which we've been talking about quite a much. Cytokines, uh, for example, interferon gamma would be one. And then specific cytokines yield a very specific, so specific cytokines are going to yield on the B cell, uh, or in this case, uh, context of a differentiated B cell even, a specific cytokine can yield a very specific transcription factor. These specific cytokines giving us a specific transcription factor is going to result in the transcription of a specific gene. So say for example you wanted to go from a IgG uh, to say the IgE isotype, right? Because the binding site isn't really being changed here so much. So you release a specific site of the kind that's going to go ahead and stop the transcription of IgG and change that. Uh, so in this case it would be in the gamma C gene for the switched region of the gamma gene and now we're going to go ahead and change this to being transcribing the uh, IgE, the upsilon regions here. This is going to make transcription happen at the specific switch regions that we're talking about here. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions that a lot of people have is that this transcription that's happening here is what ultimately results in this conversion from whatever isotypes that you're talking about here. This transcription does not result in the conversion of isotypes. This transcription results in a sterile transcript. I'm just going to say ST because I don't think that's superbly important, but as transcription is happening here, this opens up the DNA, and if we're opening up the DNA, we can go ahead and have certain enzymes come in and do their thing, and that's what's what, why we're doing this. So transcription is happening just to open up the DNA. We're not making anything superbly fun. So then, during the process of transcription, there's really just three uh, enzymes and proteins that are going to come in and do their things on this. This is known as activation-induced cytosine deaminase, which hopefully you remember what that does. And then the other two that are kind of unique to this process are known as uh, uracil DNA glycosylase and then APE1, which um, I don't really remember. I think it's a basic. But basically, the E part should tell you that it's an endonuclease, and we'll talk about what it does in each and every one of these. So during transcription, AID is going to act. This is going to be first, then this guy is second, and then this guy is going to be the third to act. What AID does, in case you don't remember, it takes a cytosine and removes an, a an amide from it, or an amine from it, sorry, and converts that cytosine to a uracil. So that's what AID does. Then after that, so I'll go ahead and draw that in white. The next step that's going to happen is UND comes in. So as, you, as its name kind of implies, the uh, enzyme known as uracil DNA glycosylase is going to go ahead and remove the uracil. So removes the uracil. 
Now, we're just removing the uracil, we're not removing the uh, sugars or anything like that. It just doesn't have the, the nitrogenous base attached to it. And, oh, snap, sorry, switch colors to gold. And then APE comes in, and what APE is going to do is it's going to go ahead and just ultimately cleave off that abasic nucleotide, the nucleotide that doesn't have that. So once we've done that, we've officially kind of left these nicks, these uh, open cuts in the DNA. And that's why we did this. And there's lots of really cool videos, but Garland Science is a bunch of cocksuckers and copyright laws on YouTube or shit. So, <laughs> but I advise you, you can find them through their websites. What this results in is this is going to result in cuts in the DNA. What's going to happen is after we've had these cuts in our DNA, we're essentially just going to pull out everything that's in between the, the two cuts. So if we were to try to just visualize this, and it's, I'm not the best in the world at drawing this here, but we have ourselves some DNA here. We have two points where we've, I'll just go ahead and do this color coordinated here. We have two points where we have cut. So that's from the whole activation of AID and the activation of UNG that happened during the transcription of this. And we don't really care about the product of that transcription. And then there's the other regions, switching to white, right here. So after we have this cuts in DNA, well essentially DNA repair enzymes are gonna come in and they're gonna remove this part here. It's gonna form a little loop. We're gonna combine these two ends here and it's gonna send out. And then we're gonna go ahead and just fuse these two things here and we're gonna get ourselves just a solid piece of just straightforward DNA. So after the cuts in DNA come in, we're gonna go ahead and just merge everything together and cut out the parts on either side of those nicks. Repair enzymes come in, and what we're left with after this process is done is essentially a, a I'm going to just call it a, a coding joint, if you could think of it, or, or a group of DNA that contains only one uh, actual uh, isotype gene. So only one isotype gene. And so obviously, in case you didn't notice this, but isotype switching is an irreversible process.